In college, I was a pioneer female science student. I was a chemistry major at Missouri University, and there were always more men than women in math and science courses in the 50s. There was only one woman professor at the University of Missouri chemistry department, but zero at the large college of chemistry at UC Berkeley, where I went to graduate school. In my class of 50 incoming PhD students, there were only two women. There were women assistants around, but it's too easy to get into that assistant role. That's not a good role model for a PhD candidate. At Colgate, I was a pioneer female teacher. I was among the first women on the faculty at Colgate. I was asked to come in and teach a full load of first-year chemistry classes, even though I had five children at that point. After the first year, I moved to part-time. I was in sciences, so I was always outnumbered by males within the department. To me, having Colgate accept women was inevitable, but it wasn't inevitable to many of the senior Colgate professors who told me women will never be admitted here. I was affirmative action director at Colgate for two different three-year terms, and the big issue was attracting good women and minority candidates and providing an environment where they wanted to stay at Colgate. Also, it was a matter of convincing some of the community of the importance of having a diverse faculty. In retirement, I am a pioneer in helping Burmese refugees. My husband and I have started our own fund for the education of Burmese refugees. Our first trip to Thailand, we lived in a Karen refugee camp for seven months and taught English to the teachers at the camp and absolutely loved it, both the people and the experience. Now we go back, January through March, every year. Our goal is to educate the young people who really want to stay and work with their people and help solve the problems that are there in the refugee camps and border areas, and even back in Burma. We work at all levels, from kindergarten to university. If there is no elementary school for the children, we try to help them start one. Thailand at first refused to allow children of migrant workers or refugees into their schools. We started a school at Dr. Cynthia's for these children and this has been copied by other NGOs so that there are now 62 Burmese schools in the Maysot area. This is really a literacy program. The main point is to teach them how to read and to teach them some numbers. We support elementary schools inside Burma also and some right on the border. Some of our work is trying to get the kids into high school and university. This year we're giving over 200 scholarships to students in Thailand for this and 50 more in India. When working with our foundation, we like to go where other NGOs are not working. We are involved in the northeastern section of India, which hasn't had the economic development recently that much of India has had. It is very isolated and not open to tourists. We even have to get invited to come in there by someone who knows us. And that's been the appeal of working there. There are no other NGOs there. We know that even a small award will keep a student in school. These students are allowed into the Indian school system, and some have done incredibly well. We have four students in medical school in India now, and 40 more at university. We're unique in that most organizations that do work overseas are much bigger than we are, and they have their own delivery system of professionals who go to Asia or go to Africa and stay there. Our organization is all volunteer because we want to make our dollars go entirely to refugee education. We and our son Chris enjoy the field work ourselves. We want to share that experience with other volunteers as well.